Today we'll be in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to start going through 3, 4, and 5 for this week, to end the week out. And these are going to be three of the more difficult passages in the Bible. Uh, in fact, there's part of chapter 5, where you get into 5, uh, verse 12 through 21, that some people say is one of the most complicated passages in Scripture. And uh, we'll see a lot of things that are going to bring up a lot of questions in your mind. Today is going to bring up a question also looking back at what about the people who um, were in the Old Testament and how were they saved? That's a big question people ask. How were those people saved? So I'll try and clear some of that up today. Um, you'll probably have a lot of questions. Um, feel free to ask me if you have questions about it, if I don't explain it real well. Uh, it's kind of complicated for our mind to wrap around some of these concepts. Um, but we'll also be looking at one of the most um, well-known passages in all of Scripture, Romans 3.23, where it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As we get ready to lead into that well-known verse, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, you've looked there in chapter 1 where he laid it out very clearly about people who have just gone to their own wickedness, they've walked away from God. He gave graphic detail about how people far, far from God uh, who've rebelled completely against God and uh, openly against God, how they have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Chapter 2, he also got into the fact that there, he said, what about those of y'all who are trusting your religion, who know the law, who know the, the things God wants, but you're more wrapped up in what you believe and what your rituals and religion are, and you, though, you know, tell people what to do, but you really don't practice it. It's not in your heart. It's not true in how you live your life. And he said, so the first chapter showed these rebellion people against God, they sin and fall short of the glory of God. Chapter 2 is there's religious people who've done ritual things and with, made their own um, religion up and how to get to God and followed just rules and regulations. And he said they have sinned and fall short of the glory of God because it was not a heart issue or not a faith issue um, of obedience out of a love for God. And so he's going to move into chapter 3 now, and he's going to pick up on something he talked about at the end of chapter 2. And if you remember the end of chapter 2, he focused a lot on the fact that um, Jews could not trust in physical circumcision to get them into heaven. It was something that many of them had been taught for years, that there were many Jews who believed that just because they were Jewish, they had an automatic entry into heaven. And Paul says, no, that's not the truth. Um, that won't get you into heaven at all. He said, it's actually a circumcision of the heart is what he called it. It was a faith issue, it was a heart issue, not any ritual thing you could do. So after he laid all that out, he'd been talking to a lot of Jewish people here, and they probably had the question, well, if all this stuff I've been doing and taught all my life about being Jewish doesn't get me to heaven, then what good is it to be a Jew? It doesn't even matter, right? And so he wanted to, to go into chapter 3 now and say, no, no, there are benefits of being Jewish people, and, and that God is they're the chosen people of God. Uh, he chose them many, 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 many years ago. He chose them before the beginning of time, um, and he, he brought them into existence, and he has not stopped that either. So uh, let's pick up in chapter 3, verse 1, where he's going to ask the question, what good is it to be a Jew? So he says, what advantage is there then in being a Jew, or what value is there in, in circumcision? He said, actually, there's, there's many. There's much in every way. There's a lot of benefits. He said, first of all, uh, they've been entrusted with the very words of God. So that's true that God gave them what we know as the Old Testament, uh, gave them the law, gave them the Ten Commandments. He trusted them with his word. He trusted the first five books of the Bible. We know about creation, and we know about the flood, and we know about uh, all these wonderful things of Abraham, the promise of Abraham. We know this through the Jewish people. And if it weren't for the Jewish people, we wouldn't know any of this stuff. So God entrusted them with the law. That's what he says here. They've been entrusted with the very words of God. Um, they said, well, what if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? He said, no, not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar. He said, just because they don't um, practice what they preach, they don't have faith in anything, doesn't mean that God's laws aren't true, they're not right, they're not uh, real, that God is still faithful. Um, to do what he's going to do, and he's faithful to carry out his plans. He says, um, then he quotes this verse, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Now, verse 5, but if our righteousness, this is important for us to look at here, if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, then what shall we say? That God is unjust 
and bringing his wrath on us? And he says, I'm using a human argument. So let's look what the human argument he's using here. What he's saying here is, if my sinfulness and my wickedness and my disobedience, the when you look and say, well, here's where I am way over here, and God's way over here, and he is so much more holy and righteous, and I'm all wicked. If you can say, the more wicked I look, the more holy God looks, because he... It, it magnifies his holiness. In other words, if we were just like God, you wouldn't see the, the glory and majesty of God if we were just like him. This is the human argument. So they say, well, why don't I just get as unrighteous as I can? And, and other, the other thing is, how can God get mad at me for being real wicked and unrighteous because it makes him look good? He said, this is the human argument. which It's not true, but that's the human argument. They go, well, I guess if I just sin more, then it'll make God look better. no. He says, uh, certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Well, someone also might argue and say, well, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as we are being slanderously reported as saying, as some claim they would say, let us do evil that good may result. And he says their condemnation is reserved. reserved. So he's saying, look, if, if my sinfulness will show um, how bad I am, will make God's perfection and holiness look better, then wouldn't God be happy about that? Because it makes him look better. Or to say, well, if if I sin more, it allows God to show how forgiving he is and show his grace and mercy more. So shouldn't God reward me for making him look better? That's kind of this human argument Paul's talking about here. And he says, no, that's not the way to look at this. Um, that's a terrible way to look at this. God is not glorified when we sin. He's, he's, he is brought glory when we trust him and, are, and when we're obedient to him. So now Paul's going to lay out almost like a court case beginning in verse 9 where he's going to really prove how sinful we are leading into that big verse in 23 where it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's going to lay this out getting ready for verse 23. So it says, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better than those people? said, not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. So he's done that, like I said, in chapter 1, chapter 2, he's laid it out. We've all sinned. Then he starts to quote uh, out of Psalm. He says, as is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All are turned away. They've all together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. Their voice, their, their poison of the poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God um, before their eyes. So he tries to, he's really laying this out about how we are absolute sinners. And one thing I've noticed in life is I've never had to convince someone um, that they're a sinner. I've never had anybody that I've had to convince they were a sinner. Now, I've had some people, uh, it's funny because you would think it's the people who have no background in church or Christianity or anything like that who may be more inclined to be arrogant about their self-righteousness and think I'm a good person. But the problem I've seen is, is in the most devoted church people. I've seen a lot of church people who are so self-righteous and so holier than thou, and they are just act like they're above reproach and they're arrogant about their so-called faith in Christianity, but I've never seen the fruit of it in their lives. And it's real funny, this is just a side note, um, that people I've seen often who are the holier than thou self-righteous types usually don't serve very much in a church. If they do, they do it to make themselves look good and, and get power. But to be a humble servant, I've, I don't know if I've ever seen one in all my years of church work. They don't do things out of humility and service. They do it for power and prestige. And so the the thing here is saying, look, we all, all of us are unrighteous. We've all done things. And he's laid this out for three chapters now. So he gets to verse 19 and he says, uh, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in the sight by observing the law. 
Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So what he's trying to say here is the law doesn't save you. The, the law doesn't, you, you can't just sit there and say, well, I'll do everything in the, in the law, follow all the rules, and therefore I'll be saved because no one can keep all the laws. I mean, we, we all mess up if we're under the law. He says the only purpose of the law was not saying here is a list of things you do to get saved. He said the actually it's the opposite. The law is there to point out your sin. It's just to make you see that you're a sinner. And so um, verse 21, he says, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The law and the prophets of the Old Testament were pointing to Jesus toward God's way of righteousness, of who Christ is, that Christ is our righteousness. If you remember, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians 5, 21, very famous verse. It says, "He talking about Jesus, he became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, saying Jesus was the only one who was truly righteous. We look at chapter one, chapter two, this list in chapter three you just did. All of us have done that except one, Jesus. So Jesus is the only human being who's ever lived who was completely righteous. He was a righteous, completely perfect man. And so this is that a now a righteousness from God, Jesus, apart from the law, not following his rules and everything, but trusting in Jesus. The law and the prophets pointed toward Jesus. They were all moving us toward Jesus. He said, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus to all who believe. And there is no difference, and here we go, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So he said, we've all, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but most people don't go to the next part. It says, and we're justified, which means our sins are forgiven. We're made right in God's eyes. Our sins are forgiven freely. We can't work for it by his grace, through God's grace. It's a free gift. And God says, I love you and I'll offer this. And it comes through Jesus. Now this next verse says how that happens. Okay, how does it come through Jesus? It says, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. All right, let me kind of back up here and help you understand um, what's being spoken of here where it says it came through um, his atonement, his sacrifice of atonement uh, through the blood of Jesus, faith in this blood. Uh, this goes back to the Old Testament. Um, many of you know if you, you've seen there was a tabernacle that the Jews would, would worship in, and one day they built a permanent temple in Jerusalem. But they, as they're moving from Egyptian slavery to what we now know as Israel, to Jerusalem, as they would go along, they would have this tent that was a temporary uh, temple. It was called a tabernacle. And it was a tent where they would go, and that's where they would meet with God and worship God. When they finally got to Jerusalem, they built the permanent temple building. That Many of you have seen that, that structure. Now, in the temple complex, there was a one tent that had two parts. One was called the Holy Place, and it was where they had a table of showbread, the altar of incense. They had these things outside that the priest would go in daily and helping offer sacrifices to God. Um, they had sacrifices outside that tent. They were offering up animal sacrifices for their sin. And it was something they did continually. It was just over and over and over and over again because they would sin, and the way they would have to, to be right with God was to make a sacrifice. So this is something that was a daily occurrence. But then on one day of the year, it was called the Day of Atonement. Okay, this goes back where it says, there in verse 25, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement. Okay, so let's remember, Jesus here is going to be the sacrifice of atonement. But in the, in the Old Testament, what they do is on this one day of atonement, they would go into a special part of the, the tent called the Holy of Holies. They could only go in one day a year on the Day of Atonement, and only one person could go in there, and that was the high priest. So I hope you're following this. I feel like I'm getting a little all over the place. But on that one Day of Atonement, he would go in to the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. So if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's what they're looking for, the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark, it was a big box had a lid on it. Uh, inside the box were three things. One were the Ten Commandments, the tablets the Ten Commandments were written on. The other was Aaron, 
uh, who was Moses' brother, he had a rod that miraculously bloomed with flowers to show the power of God that Aaron was going to be the priest for the people. It was in there. And another thing was a little jar full of manna. If you remember in the Old Testament, when they were leaving Egyptian slavery, they, didn't, they needed food. And every morning, God would miraculously pro provide this manna on the ground they could collect. And it was just enough for them to eat for that day. And God did this every single day uh, miraculously to show his provision for them. And so they kept, they were able to keep one jar of that manna, and it was down inside the box as well. So those were the three things in there. On the lid, there were two angels who had their wings pointing toward each other, looking down at the lid. Now, this is important to see what verse 25 is talking about here. On the Day of Atonement, um, the high priest would be outside of that, that tent, outside of the temple, and he would they would slaughter an animal, and they'd drain all the blood out of it. The priest of them would walk into the Holy of Holies, just the high priest only, and he'd walk up to the... the um, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if you can picture this in your mind, he walks up and the lid is there and the two angels are looking down at the center of the lid, the very middle of the lid. And that middle of the lid there was where they would say was the presence of God. It was called the Shekinah glory of God. And they said that God's presence was literally right there with the people. And so what the high priest would do is he'd walk up and he would cast the sins of the people. He would speak them onto the lid. He would speak to the, the, the sins of the people, for all the people. He represented everybody. And he would basically come before God's presence, and he would speak those sins onto that where the lid was, because that's where God's presence was. After that was over, when he had done con present, confessing their sins before God, he would get the blood of the sacrifice he brought in, and he would pour it all over that lid. And he would just cover the lid with the blood, the blood. And the picture of it was is that now when God looked down on the lid, he cast, remember he cast their sins onto that lid where God was, then he covered it with the blood. So now when God looked down, he didn't see their sin. He saw the blood of the sacrifice and he accepted it and their sins were forgiven because they had made a sacrifice and the blood covered their sin, which is where if you... A lot of songs we sang, if you've been in church all your life, at least in Baptist churches, we sang a lot of songs about the blood covers our sin. His blood can wash away or cover our sin. This is the, the picture here. And it was when it did that, when God looked down and only saw the blood and the blood covered their sin, their sins were now atoned for. They were, they, their sins were no more. He didn't see their sin anymore. It was atoned for. So now, verse 25, going back, says God... God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. So it says that what happened with Jesus was when he was on the cross, he poured out all of his blood. We know that they, they ran a spear through the side to make sure all of his blood had drained out, that he was dead. He gave all of his blood, and he became that sacrifice for us. Uh, and so it says now if we trust in him, this is where it says in 25, um, it says through faith in his blood, if we come to him and ask him to forgive our sin and we trust in him, have faith in him, that Jesus' blood covers our sin. And when God looks at us now as, as followers of Christ, when he looks at us, he doesn't see our sin anymore. He sees the blood of the sacrifice, the blood of Jesus. And Jesus' blood atones for our sin. It takes care of our sin. So I hope that makes sense. It's kind of complicated, I know. And if you have questions, ask me, because that's a very important thing to understand. Um, so then it says, now here we get into the complicated part. Uh, he did this to demonstrate his justice, because in his forbearance, he'd left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So this is where we go to the people that lived before Jesus. He said, you remember, when Jesus was on the cross, 1 Corinthians 5.21 says he became sin. And God poured out his wrath, not on Jesus, but on sin. Jesus became sin itself. And God poured his wrath down on that cross, on Jesus himself, it was the sin. And he punished sin there on the cross. So you say, well, what about those people in the Old Testament? The ones before Jesus. They couldn't 
at, they couldn't trust in Jesus' death on the cross because he hadn't, hadn't come to the earth yet. So it says, God says, he did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he'd left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And he says he did this, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just, and when he justifies those who have faith in Jesus. What he was basically saying, and kind of complicated, but he was saying, look, their sins that they committed back then were paid for and punished. They were just paid for after they were alive instead of before they were alive like us. So you say, well, how then were those, were those people saved? And the, the, the concept here is that, uh, let's take Abraham for an example. Abraham, you couldn't say, well, they had the law. Oh, excuse me, I have the hiccups real bad. I had, I had knee surgery yesterday, and the they put that tube down my throat. And oh, <laughs> excuse me, I had the hiccups real bad. It's kind of embarrassing. But um, anyway, what happens before Abraham? Um, Abraham lived four hundred years before the law ever came. Adam and Eve didn't have the law. Um, Noah didn't have the law. So. You'd say, well, does that mean they're not in heaven? Well, it says in there that Abraham had, had faith and it was, it was credited to him as righteousness. So it says here this righteousness comes from God. What The best I can explain is this. This is, and I'm going to kind of go a couple ways here. Um, if you uh, buy something on credit, okay, you're going to get the benefit of it at that moment but you're not going to have it paid for until the bill comes and you pay for it later. So if you have a credit card, you go to the store, you put it on the credit card, you take the, the things home with you, and you get the benefit of those, but you don't pay for it till the end of the month. So the Old Testament people, they, they would have faith, and it was credited to them as righteousness. And so what you said, what would they have faith in? Here's what we need to look at it. It was called progressive faith, I mean, progressive revelation, that God uh, showed himself progressively through uh, different ways in the Old Testament. Um, he showed himself sometimes, we saw with the children of Israel, that he was there with them. Uh, he, he actually showed himself physically in a, um, a pillar of fire and by day, by day I mean, by night, at and cloud by day to lead the people to promised land. He did the flood. He, he showed himself in many different ways through the law. And he would progressively reveal more of himself until we get to Jesus, where we see Jesus was the was the actual image of the invisible God, is what the Bible says. So those people were able to respond to God with what they knew. Now, they didn't have the Bible like us, the New Testament like us, and they didn't know about Jesus like us. They knew there would would be a Messiah, and they had faith, and they lived by faith with what God had revealed to them at that moment. Now, they had sinned against God, but the way, let's go back to the credited to righteousness. It's kind of like back then, they had the faith that they had that God, had, that as much as they they could know God, and they trusted him and had faith in him, and when they died, they received, they received eternal life. But the sin wasn't paid for, the credit card basically wasn't paid for until Jesus came. I hope I don't know if that makes sense or not. I'm trying to explain as best I could while also trying to have the hiccups on this video. But um anyway, so um it talks about that's how they they had faith. Now there's some people that also say, um, going back to what we talked about in chapter one, what about these people in parts of the world even after Jesus? And even up to today, but we know that for many, many, many years, there were people who um, lived all over the world before we had the, the, the Bible was translated into languages and missionaries went out and told about Jesus. What, what about these people that never heard the Bible, or heard, never heard Jesus or anything? And you look back at um, Roman, Romans chapter 1, and where it says, what can be known about God has been made plain to them by what he has made through his creation. And some people say, well, if those people reach out to what they know, they believe there is something there that created him, them, 
and sustains everything, and if they try to reach out to him, them, is that like having faith, faith that is credited in his righteousness? Some people said that, that it's kind of like the Old Testament saints. Don't really know. Um, so, anyway, I'm really sorry about the hiccups. It's a bad time, but it's been like this for ever since I got out of the hospital. It's been, been like this. It's driving me nuts. So, um, verse 27 is where we are. It says, where then is boasting? In other words, boasting about how good you are and how you've earned your salvation. He said, where is it? He said, it's, a, it's excluded. You can't. You can't brag about yourself. He said, on what principle? On that observing the law? He said, no, because you can't observe the law. We've all broken it broken the law said for we um, know but that is of, of faith for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law is God the God of the Jews only is he not God of the Gentiles too yes of the Gentiles too since there's only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith uh, do we then nullify the law by this faith he said not at all rather we uphold the law so he's just making the point here Again, he's really beating this over and over. It's not about observing the law. It's not about doing good works. It's not about something you can boast in yourself. It's all about faith in what Jesus did on the cross. It's all about faith in what God did in offering his grace, his free gift of salvation, and, and trusting in him alone and saying there's nothing in it that's about me because the whole point of salvation, the, well, not the whole point, but the main Main point, we often think salvation is about us. It's about us going to heaven one day. And to us, in our mind, that is the epitome of salvation. That's a great part of salvation, obviously, one of the benefits of salvation. But the purpose of salvation is to bring glory to God. It's to bring glory to Him as the, the, the ultimate love given to us, given to people who don't deserve it, don't deserve his grace, don't deserve eternal life, don't deserve to be with him forever, don't deserve all that he does. It's to bring glory to God. And that's where he says, there is no boasting in this. You can't boast about anything. God set it up to make sure the way he said salvation is set up. He said, I'm, I'm going to make sure that you cannot give any credit to yourself. It's only going to be the outpouring of my love. And so um, that's where he, he's gotten to at this point. Um, so in the chapter four, uh, we'll be getting into, uh, talk about how Abra Abraham was justified by faith. So we'll get into a little bit more of this, of, uh, the old Testament saints. And then we'll get into chapter five as well, where it starts talk talking about Adam's role. So there's going to be a lot of old Testament stuff in the next two chapters. So I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, I hope it's, um, you're learning something, but I also hope it's drawing you closer to the Lord. So, um, keep up your reading. Reading, try and read the chapters several times. Um, you'll get something new every time. If you have questions, I already had a, bu a bunch of y'all are texting me questions um, that are great questions. If you have questions about a chapter I have not got to, please wait till I get to that one because um, some of the answers take a long time. I can't just do it in a text. So uh, I'll get there. If I haven't got to your chapter yet, I'll get there. If you have any questions about chapter, chapter one, chapter two, or chapter three, be sure and ask me anytime. I love to talk about it. So, um, hey, spend some time today in prayer. Um, spend some time with the Lord. Thank Him for your salvation. If you are saved, if you're not a Christian, or if this is making you wonder about your salvation, please um, talk to the Lord about it first. But also, I'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, if, you, if you ever wonder about your salvation, if you ever wonder if you're really going to heaven, or if you always thought you were, but now you have some doubts, um, don't, don't wait till you die and just hope. Let's clear that up. Let's nail it down. And um, then one other thing I want to tell you about. We talked about this when I did the 30 days of the New Testament. If you did that with me. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm, I'm so embarrassed by this. Um, we, uh, I asked you if you would be willing to share what God's done in your life. Either how you became a Christian or something that God's done since you became a Christian. How he's worked in your life. What, what Jesus means to you. What God means to you. This goes back to this verse. Where's the boasting? There is no boasting in us. We need to boast about God. Glorify God. God, I know you go, well, I'd be scared to say something on a video. I'd be, I just don't know. I'd be nervous. I know it's nerve-wracking. Nerve I get it. I completely get it. But do it. Boast about Jesus. I've had so many people asking me, 
Ben, when are you going to have more people do those testimonies like the ones we've already had? And I'm going, why don't you do it? Oh, I don't know if I could do it. But everybody's wanting to hear everybody else's story about bragging on Jesus. But everybody's scared to do it. So don't be scared. Don't be ashamed. Remember what Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salva salvation. He just said here, and it's not about our boasting in us. Let's boast about God. Brag on Jesus. That's what you need to do. Do it for Jesus. Don't, don't do it for me. Don't do it for yourself. Don't do it for anybody. Do it to say, Jesus, I want to brag on you, and I'm going to use technology that we have today to spread that message and give people, let people see what you've done in my life. Do it, do it, do it. I'll help you through it. I'll walk with you through it. I'll make it as comfortable as I can for you and as best we can for you. But let me know if you'd like to do it. I think it would be a blessing in your life and be a blessing to someone else. So that's all I got. So y'all stay in your reading. We'll be on chapter four tomorrow.